Okay, um, uh, let's start. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, uh, in these challenging times. Uh, it's been a difficult period for all of us in many ways. And uh, we are grateful that we have the opportunity to share our experiences and expertise in this area. And we are looking forward to this uh, webinar series with you. So our webinar series is looking after uh, pregnant women and their babies during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this first one is on antenatal care. I am Professor Shakila Tangarachinam. I am the co-director of the WHO Collaborating Center at University of Birmingham. And this is a joint University of Birmingham and LE charity webinar series. Some housekeeping rules. This webinar series is being live streamed and recorded. So if you don't want your pictures to be seen, then please switch off your video. We have a chat functionality in the Zoom. And for those of you who are uh, seeing us on YouTube, there's also a chat functionality on YouTube. And uh, our hosts will be collecting the questions as they come in. And so the panelists can answer. We'll try to answer most of the questions. And if we can't, We'll try to address them in the next webinar series. And the hashtag for those of you who are on Twitter is Global Preg Call. Uh, Caroline, Nawai, and Uma are the hosts today. So a uh, quick uh, icebreaker. Uh, we'd like to know where you're coming from. We've got uh, participants from many countries who've registered. Um, so we're going to just show, uh, bring out a poll. Can you please select the region you're from, please? Caroline, please let me know when you're ready. It's just a click uh, on the uh, on the region. Okay, last five seconds and we'll close the poll. Okay, uh, let's see the results, please, Carla. Okay, excellent. So uh, we have from uh, Europe, predominantly on the Zoom, uh, followed by South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, can we have the next uh, poll question, please? Do you want me to relaunch the poll, Caroline? Okay. 
Okay. Are you currently managing patients with COVID-19? Okay, oh, excellent. So uh, it's sort of half and half. So half of you have been currently managing and others probably are expecting. Okay. Thank you. It, it's very helpful to know our audience. Um, there are also others watching us on YouTube. This is just to give an idea of the uh, number of uh, people who registered. We got um, uh, potential participants from over 35 countries who are joining us today. Okay, coming to the aim of the webinar series. Our aim is to share uh, what we know. In, uh, we are from UK and you know that we were one of the hardest hit in Europe. Uh, and we've been working both on the clinical side and the research side, and it's for us to share um, our findings until now. The most of the studies have been focused so far on the direct effects of COVID-19 on the maternal health. Um, so we're looking at COVID-19 related complications like um, pneumonia, death, uh, and serious organ fa multi organ failure. There are also pregnancy related complications that are as a concern for obstetricians. But of significant concern is also the indirect effect. And this was a recent paper by Robertson in the Lancet Global Health, showing even a, a small reduction by up to 20% in the maternal health coverage in low and middle income countries. It's expected to result in over 12,000 additional maternal deaths in six months alone. And it goes as high as 56,000 maternal deaths in six months if the coverage is uh, reduced by half. Um, so it's not just the effect of COVID on women but their ability to access the change in services, which many of you have got uh, or currently are having issues with and the problems it could pose for the mother and the baby. So this is our topics that we are planning to cover today. I shall start by giving a brief uh, overview on the clinical features and outcomes of SARS-CoV-2 infection in pregnancy. And we followed it by details about the diagnosis and management of COVID-19, the antenatal care of women with COVID-19, as well as in the changed scenario of healthcare services remodeled in a pandemic. And finally, the role of antenatal ultrasound during the pandemic. So with regards to the overview, I would like to focus on three things, prevalence, clinical manifestations, and outcomes. So the best way to know what's on hand is a systematic review because there's so many studies that have been published pretty much each day. I mean, it's almost exponentially increasing with the spread of the pandemic. So it's been very difficult for clinicians and health uh, guideline bodies to make sense of the vast numbers of studies coming through. So what we've done is um, we've started a living systematic review uh, looking at all questions related to COVID-19 in pregnancy, starting from the prevalence, uh, risk factors, outcomes, mother to child transmission, uh, done at our WHO collaborating center in Birmingham, uh, along with collaborators globally. But the aim of a living systematic review is we constantly search for evidence every week and we update the analysis every two weeks and we put out a report on this website every month. Uh, so as the evidence accrues, we assess their quality and we provide you the latest evidence. So these are our findings so far uh, with the search on the 12th of May. We should be able to publish in uh, soon the next set of results. So what we found so far is about 5% of pregnant women are diagnosed with confirmed COVID-19. Of course, it depends on what sort of screening strategy they are using to diagnose. But what's also interesting is 1 in 10 of asymptomatic women, so apparently appear normal, 
are now diagnosed with COVID-19. And this number is quite high, it's 82% if you look at symptomatic women. And what are the commonest symptoms that pregnant and recently pregnant women with COVID-19 present with? Cough and fever seem to be the commonest symptoms followed by muscle ache, breathlessness and diarrhea. But what's interesting is the pattern of symptoms is very similar to what's observed in general population. But the frequency consistently, it seems to be much less in pregnant women than what's observed in the general population. And if you look at the uh, laboratory findings, again, lymphopenia and raised C-reactor protein, very similar to what we are finding in the general population, appear to be the commonest abnormalities um, that have been reported so far, followed by abnormal liver function and raised procalcitonin. Uh, and 7% also do present with low platelets. And if you look at the maternal outcomes uh, in pregnant and postnatal women. Uh, about 5% are admitted to the intensive care unit. Uh, eight out of 10 are diagnosed with pneumonia, but we need to bear in mind that a lot of the studies, initial ones came from China. And so it could be that the definition of pneumonia also varies according to the um, uh, settings. 2% uh, appear to need invasive ventilation. If you look at pregnancy related complications, uh, 15% uh, is the rate of preterm birth. And again, the initial studies seem to suggest um, a, a large number, more than 30 to 35%. And this proportion seems to be coming down because I'm only providing you uh, the overall preterm birth. It could be both iatrogenic and spontaneous. Uh, the iatrogenic could be because of concerns uh, about the maternal medical situation and therefore ending with preterm birth. And six out of 10 cesarean section, again, these, these numbers, estimates are coming down as we get more and more larger studies coming up. So I, I would uh, advise caution in interpreting it. There are very few studies that are providing us with comparative estimates. So pregnant with COVID, with non-pregnant women with COVID. And that's one of the reasons why it's too early for us to say, what is the additional risks posed are pregnant women at higher risk than those with general population for COVID related outcomes. So far, that does not seem to be the case. Unlike other MERS and other previous SARS infections, pregnancy per se does not seem to pose additional risk of complications uh, for COVID related outcomes. And if you look at pregnancy related maternal outcomes, uh, there might be a potential increase in rates of preterm birth Again, we need more comparative data to with pregnant women without COVID-19 to have um, these estimates with confidence. And if you move on to the fetal and neonatal outcomes, there does not seem to be an additional risk of stillbirths and neonatal deaths. I mean, overall, the proportion per se seems to be uh, not that high. And again, as I said, we need larger studies to look at comparative data. Uh, the admission to the uh, neonatal unit, as you can see, is eight out of 10. And this is not necessarily because the baby is poor. It could be because clinicians had a policy of separating the babies in some, uh, uh, particularly in the earlier studies, uh, or there were concerns about mother to child transmission and therefore the baby was sent to the unit. Or prematurity could be another reason why the baby went to the unit. So I would advise caution in interpreting the high rates of admission to the neonatal unit. It's not a reflection of the disease on the neonatal outcome, but the actions around the diagnosis leading to the admission to the neonatal unit. Uh, so we could say that existing evidence has not identified major risks of complications in babies born to mothers with COVID-19. Uh, there have been a few questions asked about the rates of miscarriage. Uh, to date, there is no evidence that the rates of miscarriage is increased. And again, we are limited with the evidence because there are very few mums with first and early second trimester uh, reported in the studies for us to say, okay, the rate of miscarriage is increased or decreased. But based on the current data, we have not identified an increase in the risk of miscarriage so far. 
So that's an overview from my side. And I would like to now invite Dr. Heinka Kunst, who's a consultant in respiratory medicine, who's based at Barcelt NHS Trust in London. And Heinka has been on the thick of it managing uh, individuals, including pregnant women with severe COVID. And she's here to talk about the diagnosis and management of COVID-19. Heinka, over to you. Uh, a very well, a very uh, well a welcome to all of you. Um, I have been working, as Shakila said, as at the forefront, um, uh, and uh, I've seen many uh, patients with um, COVID nineteen. Shakila, next slide, please. And I am going to talk about today um, about diagnostic tests, about sampling, uh, and also about the current uh, diagnostic tests that we've got available, uh, the um, reverse transcriptase PCR and antibody tests. And I'm also going to uh, tell you a little bit about the uh, diagnosis, how you diagnose COVID-19, the differential diagnosis, uh, and also treatment. Uh, and to start off with, um, I'm sure that um, many of you may not have access uh, to uh, real-time reverse transcription PCR, uh, but this is really the gold standard that we've got at the moment. Uh, and most of us are used to, um, uh, could we just go back to the previous slide, please? Um, most of you are used to uh, sampling the upper respiratory tract, uh, and usually we do a nasopharyngeal and an oropharyngeal swab. Uh, but you can also do a nasal wash or you can test saliva. Uh, and uh, in especially in intubated patients, you can do a tracheal aspirate or bronchoalveolar lavage. But the problem is that the accuracy of the PCR test really varies. The test sensitivity varies by type of specimen. And when I started to work uh, on COVID wards in March, we had not very good tests, but then over time they did improve. Next slide, please. Uh, and the combination of nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal uh, swab samples seems to be more sensitive uh, for diagnosis of uh, COVID compared to the nasopharyngeal swab alone. Uh, but saliva testing has also been very uh, useful, and this is uh, especially uh, kind of uh, used in self-testing. Uh, and there's currently an ongoing study, um, uh, a testing a point of care, um, a test uh, compared to laboratory testing. Uh, and we are awaiting the results. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is actually us doctors uh, uh, taking blood for antibodies. Uh, we don't really know what, uh, uh, what the antibody tests will, uh, what value they will have in the future. At the moment, they've got a limited diagnostic uh, use. Um, and the uh, detection of antibodies uh, does not really indicate directly protective immunity. Um, the correlates of protection for COVID-19 have not been yet established. Uh, usually IgM and IgG antibodies uh, to SARS-CoV-2 develop between six to five, 15 days post disease onset, but we don't really know how long the uh, antibody response um, uh, is lasting and uh, antibodies um, responses wane over time. We know this from other coronaviruses. Next slide, please. Uh, and, but serological tests um, like these antibody tests have been used as an additional diagnostic test in patients strongly suspected of having COVID-19. Uh, and uh, it, it has uh, been useful for patients presenting late after symptom onset to health uh, care facilities and where a virus put, uh, detection so the uh, PCR was negative despite strong indications of infection. And it's also got a potential use for informing really the decision on discharge of patients who recovered from COVID-19 but remain RNA positive. Um, 
and uh, saw the differential diagnosis of COVID-19 pneumonia, uh, you always have to consider that a patient may have a community acquired pneumonia. And we've seen certainly patients with pneumococcal pneumonia. Uh, so it is worthwhile if you have got the facilities also, also to check for pneumococcal antigen, for example, in urine. Influenza, common cold, aspiration, pneumonia, and of course, other bacterial and viral infection. Uh, and uh, I happen to also be a TB physician, and you do need to differentiate uh, tuberculosis as TB can give you at times very similar um, radiology, especially on CT scan. And I remember quite a few patients where we were convinced they had TB, but in, in fact, they just had COVID-19. And similarly, uh, P PJP, um, which uh, uh, you will find uh, in your HIV um, uh, infected individuals um, can also look very similar. Next slide, please. Um, so the problem is that, that the PCR tests that I was mentioning earlier are not able to show how the disease might progress in an individual, which is a main downside. Um, and uh, if, the, uh, if the PCR is negative with clinical features suggestive of COVID-19, uh, especially when only the upper respiratory tract samples uh, were tested, then uh, you are really advised to take multiple samples if that's possible. Um, especially from the lower respiratory tract. And we've had many patients who I've tested five times and at the six uh, test, they were positive. And this was just important because of the fact, because we did not really know whether or not we can safely uh, discharge a patient or uh, get them to a non-COVID ward. Um, so combination of a PCR and clinical features and radiology is very important. Next slide, please. Uh, now I want to discuss treatment options uh, because uh, this is uh, something, of course, which is extremely important, not only from the non-pregnant um, uh, 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 individuals uh, point of view, but also uh, for pregnant women. Uh, and um, you may have already seen this in the, uh, in the news, um, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine really is uh, yeah. currently not recommended anymore for the treatment of COVID-19, except in a clinical trial. Uh, so at the moment, you may have heard of the recovery trial, which is one of the largest trials, uh, uh, treatment trials in COVID-19. Uh, they are continuing to uh, um, include uh, hydroxychloroquine as an arm, but the uh, WHO-funded solidarity uh, trial has stopped uh, the hydroxychloroquine arm. Uh, and then there's, of course, remdesivir, uh, and we've had a lot of news of remdesivir um, in, the, in the States. Uh, which is an antiviral drug. Um, and we initially did not have uh, access to remdesivir. And it was very frustrating because we wanted to have rem remdesivir for patients, for, for example, who were profoundly immunosuppressed and had persistent um, viral, um, a high viral load. Um, and the, uh, the the consensus is at the moment uh, that we should give uh, this to hospitalized patients who are hypoxic and on oxygen, uh, and also for our patients who are on mechanical ventilation or on ECMO. Um, and um, yeah, next slide, please. Next slide. Um, I think, Shakila, with, uh, if we just go back one slide. So then there are also uh, a very uh, interesting uh, new drugs, which are the interleukin-1 inhibitors. Uh, for example, anakinra, which has been used for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and there have been some interesting results, but at the moment we have really got insufficient data to rec recommend either for or against the use of uh, interleukin-1 uh, inhibitors. Uh, what about interleukin-6 inhibitors? Again, uh, there are some small uh, studies which are showing uh, some um, uh, promising uh, results, um, especially with tocilizumab, uh, but at the moment we cannot uh, uh, recommend uh, either for or against uh, the use of interleukin-6 inhibitors. Next slide, please. 
And this is something which you may have heard in the news. Again, a convalescent plasma to treat COVID-19 and infections. Uh, and I am, uh, in fact, a site investigator from the for the recovery trial, uh, which is, you know, has recruited uh, probably um, most of the patients for COVID-19. Uh, and uh, um, it is um, felt that convalescent plasma collected from donors who have recovered from COVID-19 um, which contains antibodies against uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, that this may have an effect on reducing viral load. Uh, and uh, the recovery trial has just included this into uh, one of their arms, uh, in fact, yesterday. Uh, next slide, please. And again, this has also been all over the news, uh, the use of corticosteroids in COVID-19 pneumonia. Uh, the recovery trial has shown that dexamethasone reduces deaths. And this is something which is very important uh, and uh, because it's, uh, it's obviously cheap uh, and it does uh, reduce deaths uh, by up to one certain hospitalized patient with severe respiratory complications of COVID-19. Uh, and uh, this is of course uh, important. Um, uh, and uh, so we have, uh, in our setting, we have now um, uh, um, giving dexamethasone uh, routinely. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what about treatment of COVID-19 um, related uh, severe acute respiratory uh, distress syndrome, ARDS? Uh, uh, when I was working on the ward, and I'm usually just a respiratory consultant, uh, uh, and I don't usually treat ITU patients, but we were very quickly enrolled uh, uh, to become uh, HDU consultants. Uh, and so we, we were basically applying uh, high flow oxygen uh, and also CPAP. Uh, and we found that high flow nasal oxygen, which you can see uh, on the right in the slide on the right, it's basically just like nasal cannula, cannula and you are applying high flow oxygen and it's very much liked by patients and you are getting really uh, quite a good result of preventing intubation. Fluid management uh, is important to keep a negative fluid balance. Uh, renal replacement therapy uh, is used for oliguric renal failure and acid-based management, many of our patients uh, became uh, profoundly acidotic uh, and we uh, had to renally replace them. And again, this will be very difficult in low-income settings. Uh, we were uh, in the middle of COVID in April or, uh, or so, we were actually running out of equipment and uh, we were uh, kind of, uh, we found uh, it very hard to decide who actually needs renal replacement therapy. Antibiotics for secondary bacterial infections are important. Um, and uh, uh, I, um, quite a few of our patients actually, um, especially the pregnant uh, population, because they were all very young and had single organ failure, actually went for ECMO. Next slide. I just want to talk a little bit about cytokine storm because this is something which you need to be aware about. Uh, this uh, about 5% of patients with COVID-19 develop a life-threatening pneumonia that often occurs in the setting of uh, inflammation, or inflammation or cytokine storm. You've got a heightened cytokine release as indicated by elevated blood levels of IL-6, C-reactive protein, uh, and D-dimer and ferritin. Uh, and uh, it, this is a life-threatening event, uh, uh, and there's a very high risk of severe ARDS. Uh, and there is some evidence uh, that uh, blocking IS-6 might benefit some patients uh, with COVID-19. And we have had uh, locally, uh, we've had a guideline to give uh, tocilizumab in this scenario. Uh, and patients can rep very rapidly uh, deteriorate. Uh, and I've seen patients coming in uh, or just on uh, uh, just on oxygen uh, via face mask who then were intubated uh, in the evening. Uh, so it's just something to be aware about. Next slide, please. 
Um, so what about pregnant women with COVID-19? So uh, the solidarity trial, uh, which um, many of you may be aware of, uh, which uh, is using remdesivir, lopinavir, ritonavir, which is an HIV drug, and interferon beta 1A, which is, you, uh, which is usually used in disseminating uh, in demyelinating disease um, have revised the exclusion of pregnant women because they, were, they are initially not including uh, pregnant women. Remap CARP uh, will uh, enroll pregnant women admitted to an intensive care unit, but exclude them from randomization to antivirus therapies or immunomodulatory drugs. And these patients are obviously very sick. Uh, and the REMCAP uh, REM uh, trial uses steroids, um, also tamari and antibiotic and macrolides. Uh, and the recovery trial does include hospitalized pregnant women, uh, and it uh, and um, it uses uh, several arms: um, dexamethasone, azithromycin, remdesivir, um, the HIV drug lopinavir, and ritonavir, and tocilizumab uh, in second randomization. Next slide, please. What about venous thromboembolic uh, prophylaxis? Uh, so this has been uh, there has been a lot of debate about this, uh, and extended VT prophylaxis can be considered in patients who are at low risk for bleeding and high risk for VT as per protocols for patients, of course, without COVID nineteen. Uh, and for hospitalized patients, the possibility of thromboembolic disease should be evaluated really always in the event of rapid deterioration of pulmonary, cardiac, or neurological function, or of sudden localized loss of peripheral perfusion. And we uh, became aware of this very quickly. And the moment somebody became high, uh, profoundly hypoxic, we always did a CT Palmier angiogram. Uh, and we, uh, in fact, thrombolized uh, quite a few patients who had massive uh, PEs. Next slide, please. What about infection control? Uh, so it is recommended to screen out persons at the first point of contact with the health system in order to identify individuals that have suspected or confirmed COVID-19. This may not be possible, but from an infection control point of view, this is really important. And we've had many patients uh, or at least quite a few uh, who actually uh, acquired COVID-19 uh, in hospital. And it's just really not avoidable, especially if you are in a pa pandemic setting in low income countries, it must be uh, at times a nightmare, uh, especially if you don't have a personal protective uh, equipment. Um, and it is recommended to discontinue transmission based precautions, including isolation. Uh, for symptomatic patients 10 days after symptom onset, uh, plus at least three days without symptoms, e.g. without fever and respiratory symptoms, and for asymptomatic patients 10 days after the test had become positive. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is me standing uh, in front of uh, my hospital with a mask. This is an FFP3 mask. Um, uh, and uh, but uh, this was kind of at the beginning of the uh, epidemic. Later on, uh, uh, especially in patients where we did not know uh, whether or not they had COVID, uh, we were wearing surgical masks as recommended by Public Health England. Um, and for those of you uh, who do work in low income settings, uh, it has been uh, recommended uh, to. Uh, um, do an extended use of, of um, uh, single-use surgical masks rather than a reuse, and that's what this is what we did. Uh, we did uh, uh, keep our uh, personal protective equipment on uh, during a ward round, uh, but did uh, at times um, uh, change when we were doing, uh, for example, when we were uh, changing um, patients from uh, different ventilators, e.g., from a CPAP uh, to uh, high-flow oxygen. Um, okay, uh, so this is uh, uh, the end of uh, the lecture and I hand over uh, back to Shakila. Uh, thanks very much, Hanka. It's been really helpful. Uh, and I know that many of you have been uh, sending questions through the chat. Uh, we, our team is collecting it and we'll address them at the end of the, uh, of the talk to the panel. So moving on to, thanks very much, Hanka, again. Moving on to our next panelists. I would like to invite Dr. Rehan Khan, who is a consultant in maternal medicine based at the Royal London Hospital. Uh, Rehan was also one of the lead 
individuals in the development of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists guidance on maternal medicine guidance during the pandemic. And he's here to talk about antenatal care during the pandemic. The Zoom is yours, Rehan. Well, thank you very much. And uh, uh, I may I take this opportunity to thank you all for uh, uh, attending this webinar. Um, next slide, please. So I, I, um, I think one of the one of the many challenges here is how to contextualize a very new infection in the middle of everything which people usually do. And one of the absolutely unique things about pregnancy care is that it cannot and does not stop. And this is unlike many other aspects of medicine. So we, in, I think all over the world, in all healthcare settings, have seen that as um, health services become more pressurized, as more and more people become sick, uh, there have been consequences on what health services can or cannot be delivered. And there's been a lot of conversation about the idea that routine care must stop, but pregnancy goes on. Whether there's a, a COVID pandemic or not, somebody's estimated due date is somebody's estimated due date. And that is absolutely unique. In emergency rooms, in pediatric departments, in, in cancer hospitals, there has been a decline in uh, the numbers of uh, patients they were looking after. This is not the case in maternity. We are different in that way. So it repays thinking about things, perhaps absolutely from first principles. Next slide, please, Shafina. And if we're really going to think about first principles, we might want to think, for the purposes of this talk, what's, what, what is care for? We might want to think, what actually is maternity care for? Or we might just want to think, full stop, what is care? And actually, that is perhaps not such a poor question as you might think. Next slide. So I, I think, next, thank you. So I, I, think, I think we probably would agree that the purpose of care is to try and help people with medical problems. Maybe if we've got the resource to do it, to try and prevent problems and maybe even to uh, promote well-being. But there are challenges. Next slide, please. And the challenge, thank you. The challenges include this. One of, the, one of the objects of care is to help other people, but it is not an object of care for us, the caregivers, to die in the process. That is not the object. And actually, with a pandemic, by coming into contact with um, patients, with women, we potentially put ourselves at risk. And we have all been feeling this all over the world. And uh, one of the things that we've observed in the United Kingdom is there has been a very explicit appreciation of caregivers, and uh, um, that's shown in, in this uh, sort of clapping exercise, which was happening every Thursday evening. Now, it's an explicit uh, invitation for people to thank us for what we're doing, but it's also an acknowledgement of one or two other more subtle things, which, which, uh, which are that we're putting ourselves in some ways potentially in harm's way, and also, therefore, patients are relatively wary of us and of hospitals and of places where they can give birth or receive care. And that, together with some other factors, can cause a degradation of care. So therefore, we have to think a little bit along the lines of how do we best look after our patients, but we also have to think about how we'll look after ourselves. Next slide, please. Thank you. So therefore, it, it is not enough to think about minimizing the risk to patients. We have to think about minimizing risk to ourselves. And in order to do that, we certainly must challenge ourselves in terms of what we do, how we do it, and where we do it. So I think these are some key principles. And on the next slide, please, you'll see some resources which uh, I think might help you, because this is largely where these slides are taken from. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, this is a field which is continuously developing. Uh, the confession and apology that uh, myself and any colleagues who've been involved in any regional or national or international guidelines that, that you will read is that we have done our best in difficult situations and actually we have no data at the beginning and therefore it is important to note that these guidelines are not in stone and it, it is important to revisit and keep revisiting them as new data and new information of the likes which Dr. Kunst has reported to us today 
comes in. Next slide, please. So let's really challenge ourselves now. We have women who are pregnant and they're frightened. They actually perhaps do not want to come into a healthcare setting such as a hospital to be seen, but we have to ensure safe care. So both Shakila and Heinke have alluded to ideas that from what we understand so far, it is not necessarily the case, unlike MERS or SARS, that COVID affects pregnant women in a disproportionate way. So it's not that they are unaffected, but it's that the, the effects they are uh, experiencing are proportionate. But nonetheless, this is frightening. But we must be mindful that whilst this is going on, if we do not ensure adequate care during the pregnancy for the mother and the baby, we may suffer loss. So we know from before the pandemic that there is evidence that five visits or less is associated with an increased risk of perinatal mortality. And in the United Kingdom, therefore, the pragmatic solution that we have come up with is that a minimum of six face-to-face -face consultations must happen. Now, I think by face-to-face, -face, what I'm inferring here is the entry criterion for a face-to-face -face con consultation is in order to have to touch someone. That might mean taking a fundal height measurement. Uh, that might mean checking someone's blood pressure. It might mean dipping their urine. Uh, we will talk about some innovative solutions to some of those problems later. But we cannot entirely devalue the idea of face-to-face -face contact in the context of pregnancy, because actually it's likely to make a significant difference. We also have to consider who's going to do that. Now, the answer to that is going to depend on how maternity care is arranged in a particular locality. In the United Kingdom, where Anka and Joe and Shakila and myself work, predominantly most antenatal care is done by midwives, whereas doctors tend to restrict their care to high-risk pregnancy. So for the face-to-face -face contact, it is predominantly midwives who are delivering that. And I'd like to take this opportunity to salute all of my midwifery colleagues in the United Kingdom and all over the world who have bravely continued to do this despite the difficulties. Next slide, please. Uh, Rehan, uh, can you also speak a bit louder, please? Uh, just okay. is, that, is that better? Yes. Okay. I, I uh, don't know how to do that other than to move closer to the computer. So I've done that. Now, uh, we have had to think a little bit about adjuncts to care, because where previously we were doing face-to-face -face appointments, now perhaps we're not so able. So that is particularly true in certain settings. So if the resource is available, that may include consultations on the telephone or using video apps. So some examples of why, where that might be useful or, or important can be divided into items where perhaps you aren't perhaps not required to see someone face to face, such as a mental health consultation or a birth planning consultation, or different situations where you rely on the fact that a different caregiver has done the face to face part in the United Kingdom, that's a midwife, but you perform specialist or high risk pregnancy care uh, by obstetricians over the telephone or using an app. But we also have to be mindful that some women are infected and therefore cannot attend for appointments or scans and that some women are medically so vulnerable in or out of pregnancy because, uh, say, they have particular medical comorbidities, that actually they are not only disincentivized, but essentially almost forbidden from seeking care. And that is particularly important. It's especially important to think in this context about women who have inadvertently potentially been excluded from care and are therefore potentially more at risk of maternal or fetal morbidity or mortality. Next slide, please. Thank you. So <clears throat> in this context, we now think about where the care should be delivered. And uh, in a hospital, there is a huge incentive to reduce footfall in, in order to reduce the load of the virus in the hospital. And so we have really had to think about whether care should be in the hospital or whether it should be at home. And we have a fantastic infrastructure through midwifery for home visits in the United Kingdom, which has thrown up its own dilemmas around personal protective equipment and around how one makes the inquiry before one visits someone's house about whether anyone has symptoms at the house. And that is genuinely difficult. I think in, genu in general, although people want to help, many of my midwifery colleagues have told me about really difficult experiences where they had phoned ahead and then turned up to find someone obviously had a respiratory infection. And it just illustrates 
the need for planning in advance of encounters far more than we used to do. Next slide, please, Shakina. <clears throat> and, and of course, beyond all of this, all of us who give care then go home. So we've got to travel to and from work and we've got to potentially expose our loved ones at home or get exposed by them. And some of us have our own health conditions and actually shouldn't be at work. And all of this has had and continues to have an enormous impact on the care that we can give on, and on our, our own safety. And we have additionally had to really carefully think about our estate in which we work and <clears throat> how to perform good infection control in, in these areas within the hospital. How to really carefully think about patient flow about how patients come in and out of the building or in and out of the department. Next slide, please. So we have used some alteration to care schedules. We have thought very carefully about the antenatal booking appointment and made that either virtual or one stop. And we've really been trying to plan care so that rather than coming on a Monday for a scan, on a Tuesday for a blood test and on a Wednesday for an appointment, we've been trying to in advance work out if some of these items can be co-located in place and in time. Uh, we've used remote appointments and we've, as time has gone on, really, really had to think about who might be excluded from care or who might be at more risk. So now we specifically come on to COVID. So we all already acknowledged that diabetes and high body mass index were pregnancy risk factors. We now acknowledge that these comorbidities are risk factors for disease severity in COVID-19. And as the perfect storm that has developed in the United Kingdom and the United States in particular, is um, a disproportionate effect in terms of perhaps severity of illness on certain groups. So in particular, for those of you unfamiliar with the acronym, BAME means Black and Minority Ethnic Groups. Now, that is a particular thing that we are seeing in some parts of the world. But I think perhaps the lesson we can learn is that in this particular situation, groups of people who are potentially excluded from good health care at the best of times may be particularly vulnerable at these worst of times. Let's go to the next one, please. So we're now going to talk a little bit about uh, a data set which has emerged from the United Kingdom uh, via Marion Knight's group at UCOS. Next slide, please. And this is as hard as we have in terms of data, and it, it does demonstrate that we believe during a particular time period we had around five per 1,000 maternities admitted into hospital. So this is very difficult to clarify further because unless you have adequate testing in the community, you do not know how many people had. COVID who were not admitted into hospital, but it does, does give, give you an indication of numbers of people who have severe illness. And it, it does allow us to think about whether there are any particular characteristics. And at the time, there seemed to be some characteristics in terms of gestation. Uh, some of the points I've already made have been starkly demonstrated with regards to who is getting admitted into hospital with this infection, which in the United Kingdom is largely older mums, mums who are overweight, perhaps mums with diabetes, and especially black and ethnic minority mums. And we've been able for this cohort to follow through what happened next, both with regards to women and with the infants. So I would commend this study to you. Next slide, please. And using this information, uh, there are perhaps certain in indications about specific care in the antenatal period such as this. So we, in, it is, remains good infection control practice to not bring people up to hospital unless they need to be in hospital. So care is away from the hospital where possible. But one of the real difficulties we've had is people who are pregnant will still need to come to hospital. So we cannot exclude this as an environment for care. It is important therefore to note that a, a significant illness can cause an interruption in care. But with regards to a hospitalized patient with COVID in pregnancy, we would recommend a catch-up growth scan after 14 days, and that's probably linked to ideas that any severe intercurrent illness in pregnancy can, inter can cause an interference with fetal growth and perhaps would be a risk factor for fetal growth restriction. And also, uh, in a pragmatic analogy to what Heimkirk was alluding to with regards to venous thromboembolic disease, 
thromboprophylaxis for the admission under an additional 10 days, which I feel also acknowledges the prothrombotic nature of pregnancy itself. Next slide, please. So we'll uh, go on to talk about obstetric medicine now. And this is a link to uh, a national document that Shakila very kindly asked me to help her with uh, in the United Kingdom. Next slide, please. And it's, a, it's an unashamedly long document, so I only want to give you a few illustrative examples from this, just to show how medical problems in pregnancy uh, have care before the pandemic, but might need some rethought around care during the pandemic. So with regards to blood pressure, we are very used to doing frequent blood pressure checks on women who we suspect may be developing a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, such as gestational hypertension or preeclampsia. But using risk calculators such as the PREP tool could be a useful adjunct with regards to diagnostics and screening in or screening out women at particular risk of adverse outcomes. Um, we've also been using blood pressure monitors which can be delivered to women at home so that they can report back either by telephone or by using uh, a bespoke uh, app on their mobile phone what their readings are. And that again is a way around face-to-face -face contact and meaning that you could limit face-to-face -face contact up to what is absolutely necessary and therefore perhaps reduces the risk of disease transmission. Diabetes, in particular gestational diabetes, is, is a, a topic very close to mine and Shakila's heart because for years and years we have wondered why we bring so many women up for face-to-face -face care when in fact they can have direct care with midwives using protocolized care but also perhaps again using uh, remote transmission of blood glucose monitoring results at home, there may be other ways around. There have been really some quite interesting debates going on nationally and internationally about what gestational diabetes is. We acknowledge it's a spectrum diagnosis. And in this situation, is it really the best thing in the middle of a pandemic to be running a full glucose tolerance test with blood uh, tests being done, say, two hours apart, meaning someone has to sit in a waiting room for two hours? So these are really fundamental and practical questions, more of which my colleague Joe Aquilina will allude to in, in a minute or two, about how we conduct the best care we can in a healthcare setting. And finally, there are a few women in whom it is genuinely a risk for them to leave home. So one example is women with severe cardiac disease in pregnancy. They are genuinely at risk of having a severe illness or death if they contract coronavirus. And yet somehow, we still have to deliver care because they are also genuinely at risk of maternal death because of their severe heart condition. And we have really, really have to think about individualizing the care of these women in a very, very particular and special way. So I would like to thank you for listening and uh, I'm going to pass you now back to Shakila. Uh, thanks very much, Rehan. Uh, I would like to now invite Mr. Joe Aquilina, who is the lead clinician for fetal medicine at the Royal London Hospital, to talk about the role of antenatal ultrasound, a test that's very uh, commonly done, but how do we actually manage uh, when there is a roaring pandemic in our midst? Over to you, Joe. You're on mute, Joe. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm clear and true. Yeah, thank you, Shakila, and um, welcome uh, to London from London. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about the provision of um, antenatal ultrasound. And as Rehan rightly pointed out, you know, pregnancy is an ongoing process, and therefore, you know, we still have to use ultrasound as part of pregnancy management. I think what um, has become clear is that we certainly you know, need to have some principles how to offer the service during a pandemic. First slide, please. So um, in terms of the principles, I think it's become quite clear that possibly due to stretching of medical resources, whether it's from sickness and the, the need to social distance, we have to prioritize our scans and reduce the number if possible, and I think we are managing to do that. And the main aim for, for that is to reduce the risk of infection by reducing the number of visits and reducing the, the scanning time. Because as we know, with ultrasound, 
there is contact between the sonographer and the patients for at least 15 minutes. So this in itself is considered to be quite, you know, a high risk procedure in terms of patient contact. So therefore, the priorities have to be to reduce the number of scans, reduce the scanning time um, and keep the waiting areas uh, within social distancing guidelines. Next slide, please. So in terms of prioritization of scans, we can probably put them in three categories. You know, there are the scans that, you know, have to be undertaken in an emergency situation uh, because of, you know, various indications which we'll go through. Then you have the scans which probably can be delayed for a few weeks without affecting clinical care. And then we have a category of scans which probably, you know, can be cancelled due to the duration of the pandemic. And the effect of the pandemic has had is it's focused our minds on actually if scans are really needed or not. And we have come up with strategies to reduce the number of these. And if they're not necessary to cancel them uh, completely. Next slide, please. So if we look at this slide, I, the tier three scans are the emergency scans. These are the scans which we have to schedule immediately, whether it is for maternal or fetal indications, or whether it's for hospitalized COVID patients. Thankfully, at present, we do not have many COVID patients. Um, so therefore, um, you know, the, this category is, is, is probably quite small. But I think for all the others, we have to schedule them um, and slot them in as urgent uh, scans. In terms of the other scans, then we have the tier two, which probably can be scheduled within two to three weeks if there is concerns about infection um, without affecting clinical care. And the tier ones are the routing screen, which we're going to be talking about in a you know, in a COVID or non-COVID setting. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of low risk patients, um, we are still trying to offer, you know, the two basic scans, which are the first trimester scan and, and the anomaly scan. Um, in a situation where women are not symptomatic, provided with the um, infections, pro pro appropriate infection screens, we try and offer them within those, those windows. If there is any concern in terms of symptoms or if they're potentially screen positive based on travel, occupation, contact or cluster, this is a phrase coined by ISWOG. So if we think that, you know, these women could be, you know, at risk, we should shed, reschedule in two weeks accepting that, you know, by rescheduling, you will may miss your first trimester window in terms of screening for aneuploidy. So in this sort of scenario, what you can do is, is offer, so if you can't offer combined tests within that window, is you offer uh, maternal serum screening, accepting the fact that maternal serum screening is associated with a higher screen positive rate. What can you do about that? You know, certainly at Bart's, what we have actually done, you know, pre-COVID was triaging women um, on combined testing of risk of one in 300 or less to reflex uh, free fetal DNA testing. And what it has done is reduce our false positive rate or screen positive rate by 90%. It's had, um, a, absolutely drastic effect on the number of women coming up with screen positives. And this, you know, thankfully now is something which is serving us very well by reducing the need of women to come in for invasive testing. And we are actually adopting the same reflexing system for any woman who misses combined testing and has to have quad testing. So this is something that if is available, something worth considering to reduce your footfall and your screen positive rate in this time. In terms of the anomaly scan, if they have had um, a normal first time as a screening, then you can probably 
if you have to delay this, you've got quite a big window there. And we would recommend screen, you know, scanning beyond 20 weeks, just to primarily to reduce the risk of having an incomplete anomaly scan. In terms of the third trimester growth scan in low risk women, we feel that if you're offering it, you probably shouldn't be doing it by now because that will have a drastic effect on your number of women having to come to hospital. And I think at this present moment in time, we can say that there's no real clinical benefit and this should be scrapped altogether. And uh, next slide, please. In terms of high risk, I think the same rules apply uh, for first and second trimester as the low risk. But in terms of the uh, third trimester growth scans, um, we reduce the frequency to the minimum necessary. And we probably feel that in these women, you probably can, provided there are no, no, no pathology, reduce it to, to, a minimum, to a maximum of two. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of COVID positive patients, now the, the screening strategy should on paper remain the same, but we are ex accepting that, you know, these women are ill. Um, so certainly if women are not symptomatic, we would still reschedule the scans in two weeks, accepting that they might go beyond the gestational window. And in that sort of scenario, we would have to offer serum screening. But if you can triage or reflex these women, screen positive women, you will reduce your invasive test to quite acceptable levels as first trimester screening. And again, you know, in women who are symptomatic, uh, sorry, can you go back slide, please? In terms of symptomatic women, you know, women who are admitted, you know, in the hospital with symptoms, what we're trying to do is would be, or the recommendation would be to perform bedside scanning and then transfer the data, you know, without having to bring those women up, you know, to the scan department with all the implications that there are. I mean, you know, if you, if you have capacity and you've got one room which you can uh, dedicate to COVID women, then that's absolutely fine. But, you know, I'm aware that you know, that is probably not possible in, in many hospitals. So therefore, relying on bedside scanning, you know, in these women is recommended. And as Rehan said, if you have a COVID positive patient, the recommendation would be to offer growth scans every four weeks uh, and obviously reduce, increase the frequency dependent on findings. We feel that these women slightly high risk of fetal growth restriction and four weekly growth scans probably would, you know, would be satisfactory. Next slide, please. In terms of specialist clinics, like the preterm birth clinic, um, the recommendation would be to delay cervical assessment, say at 16 weeks, if appropriate, excluding women with, um, you know, with, proven or highly suspected cervical incompetence. I think these women probably should be offered cervical cyclage without need, without relying on serial scans at this present moment. But again, with these women, if the cervical length is stable by 20 weeks, um, it would probably be safe to discharge um, and not and do virtual clinics um, with these women as Rayhan suggested. In terms of symptomatic women, I mean COVID positive or highly suspected COVID, um, keep them away from hospital. We prescribe progesterone and delay appointment until um, the appropriate self-isolation is complete. Next slide, please. Um, now, in terms of you know, pregnancies where you have indications for regular fetal growth, those are some of the indications. The recommendation is to reduce the frequency to um, and a maximum of two. And if you are going to pick up two, two gestations, the 28 and 36 weeks are probably the best time to do, to do these scans. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to talk about uterine anti Doppler screening. Now we know that uterine anti Doppler screening in high risk population is actually very good 
if you have normal Dopplers at the first or the second trimester scan, that these women are is extremely low risk for in fetal growth restriction preeclampsia. And I would safely, you know, I would say that, you know, in women where the Dopplers are normal by 20 weeks, a single scan at 36 is probably sufficient. If these women are have abnormal Dopplers, and they probably should be on aspirin anyway by this case, but they're, if they're abnorm still abnormal by 20 weeks, the recommendation would be to start regular scans. Pre-COVID, we're probably starting at about 24, 26 weeks. But again, dependent on the individual cases and depending on the evolution of the Doppler flows, we probably would recommend as a minimum scanning from 28 weeks until 38 weeks with option for early induction um, if there's any concerns about the state of the eutropocental flow. Next slide, next slide, please. So in terms of invasive procedures, uh, as yet, because of the very few cases, we still don't know what the risk of vertical transmission is. We, if we extrapolate the data from HIV and hepatitis B, we think there is a slightly increased small risk, as uh, similar to these women, but because we don't have vaccination or methods to reduce the risk, then you know we have to counsel these women that you know the risk is is there is probably some risk if we consider an invasive procedure. Um, but if you have to go down the invasive route, we would recommend um, amniocentesis as opposed to coronal villus sampling because we know that with coronal villus sampling, there's increased viral shedding. So if you really have to do um, an invasive, you should wait at least until 15 weeks to do amniocentesis. But we accept that, you know, some women, especially with ab severely abnormal first trimester scans, might opt for, you know, coronal villus sample. Again, we don't know if there's any teratogenic effects of COVID infection. There's no data yet, and we probably might know something in six to 12 months time. Next slide, please. So scan protocols. Um, to reduce the infection risk, we would recommend that you don't you have, you have more, no more than one patient waiting per ultrasound room. Um, in terms of par par partners and children, at present, we are still, um, we, we, we do not allow women to you know bring their partners or children but we have we have devised ways to enable these women to take you know video clips or and pictures you know within this within the short scan time that that is allowed and i think we also feel the need that in this in in present state oh, sorry can you go back in the present state we need to reduce the time of scan room as short as possible, ideally to less than 15 minutes. And in fact, what we're doing is we we complete all the scan measurements and we take um, clips and we ask patients to go to the waiting room while the scan report is completed. And as far as inadequate visualization of single organ systems, certainly at the Royal London, we ask our sonographers to ask for consultant input, you know, there and then to try and complete the anomaly scans at the time and therefore reducing the need for repeated scan visits. Next slide, please. In terms of preparation for examination, I think um, at present um, we are using surgical masks, you know, throughout the examination themselves and with plastic gowns and gloves and we essentially would recommend, you know, we're asking our patients to wear masks. And certainly in English hospitals now, all women coming in for any hospital visits are expected to wear masks. And we, we know that, you know, the, the, the masks will might necessarily reduce the risk of spread for any potentially infected person. Next slide, please. Um, so, and at the end of the examination, the recommendation would be to ventilate rooms at least after every second scan. In terms of use of FFP masks, 
How often do you use them? How often do you change them? I think this very much depends on local situations and what the supply you have. I think a good compromise, certainly from our end is, we ask our sonographers to use masks for maximum of three to four hour sessions rather than changing every single time. In an ideal situation, you should change every single time, but if there are resource issues, probably every, every session. And we still, in terms of reducing risk of spread, if you don't have widespread testing of staff, is obviously to use web-based meetings and keep social distancing rules within um, rest areas. And I'm going to, we'll leave you with a slide, which is a very brief um, overall summary of scans, recommended scans during the COVID era. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Joe, for uh, the detailed uh, information on scan during the pandemic. Um, so we are, our team is collecting all of the questions that are coming through both uh, from the YouTube uh, streaming participants as well as from the Zoom participants. Um, so give us uh, five minutes and while we are collecting it, uh, I would like to invite um, Mr. Ram Navaratna Raja, who is the founder of Eli Charity, to talk about the Eli work and our panelists will be shortly back with you to answer the questions. Uh, Ram, the Zoom is yours. Hello. Hi, um, my name is Ramesan. Um, thank you very much for being um, part of the panel here today. Um, sorry. Excuse me. Um, uh, effectively, um, I'm very privileged to be part of this group. It's taken a long time over many years and different efforts to um, get to this point. Um, we're very um, uh, happy that we've had a chance to run this platform here today, open to everyone. Um, Ellie, um, the next slide, please. Um, Ellie was, uh, is actually started um, to run um, projects uh, to promote multidisciplinary training in obstetric emergencies to develop global health programs, to exchange, um, to facilitate the exchange of education and um, also facilitate staff exchanges. We also were very keen on promoting uh, global health research uh, for, for women's health um, and expressly to raise funds for various projects. Next slide, please, thanks. Teaching is, uh, huge um, part of our efforts. And we've had collaborations with the RCOG with respect to major obstetric hemorrhage courses, surgical training in the OSTEA environment, and um, um, basic surgical skills courses and exam-based courses. But we also went on um, together in collaboration with um, um, the MOMS courses run through um, Chelsea Investments and to um, uh, enable us to run uh, training schemes uh, multidisciplinary screens uh, involving midwives and other health caregivers in low resource settings um, in parts of East Africa and South India, and most recently in Borneo. All this um, needs huge collaborative um, um, uh, um, efforts on the part of um, all our health caregivers across Bart's Health um, and now Birmingham um, uh, and also our partners internationally. Um, and I think the core of this is about every woman deserving the right to a safe childbirth. Um, and today's uh, webinar is particularly around um, what's been happening in South India and Sri Lanka. We hope to get the next webinar centered around East and Central Africa. Um, and um, um, next slide, please. Um, and next slide, please. Um, and this was our first course way back uh, about six years ago. Um, and we've come a long way since then. So without too much um, uh, to carry on, because I'm sure you want all your answers, um, uh, all your questions answered as best as we can. Um, I will pass you on to um, uh, Professor Shakila and my colleagues who have been excellent. And once again, to say thank you very much for all our next slide, please. 
Um, thank you very much to all our um, uh, uh, colleagues uh, who've made this possible. And kindly please support Ellie as we move on to do other webinars um, uh, uh, surrounding safe healthcare for women. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Ram. Uh, so I can, um, uh, I'm going to start with the questions and uh, the slide you can see now is about our next webinar. It's on intrapartum care during the pandemic. So if uh, many of you have got questions on management of labor and delivery, emergency cesarean sections, obstetric emergencies, we will be answering those in that webinar. We'll also be covering the risks of mother to child transmission in neutro, intrapartum and postpartum, breastfeeding, rooming in, it will be covered in that session. Uh, also on the healthcare professionals' protective equipment while caring for women in labor for both for midwives and doctors. So all of this uh, will be part of the next webinar. So coming to the questions that we have so far, um, and Heinka, if we could start with you, um, I'm sure that you, you've also been looking at the questions and there's been questions on use of CT in conjunction with PCR and what is its role uh, for, uh, for hospitals that have access to PCR and that don't. So thank you, Shakila. Uh, so this is a very important question, uh, and I uh, don't think that many of you will have access to CT. Uh, and uh, I, I, I strongly believe, uh, and that's also what the clinical trials have shown, that you can actually uh, diagnose COVID-19 pneumonia uh, just by uh, symptoms, uh, examination, and uh, a chest uh, radiography, uh, e.g. just a simple chest x-ray. Um, and you don't necessarily really need to have a PCR. Um, for many of you, you've been dealing with uh, COVID uh, uh, patients, uh, you will, after a while, you know who has COVID because uh, the, the, the way they present uh, and the, the way they uh, kind of progress is, is quite classical. Uh, so I don't think that you necessarily need to have a CT. And even in high income countries, uh, we, we didn't do uh, many CT scans because also of the fact that you need to, each time you have a COVID-19 patient, you then need to deep clean again uh, before you can uh, scan the next patients. And and actually, uh, it, it does have, of course, if there, are, if there is a diagnostic uncertainty, for example, if you think that somebody has got PCP or, uh, or a bacterial pneumonia, uh, it is of value. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Can I just uh, ask Hank, actually? Um, I, you know, I have come across um, through ISWOG um, recommendations to do lung ultrasound at the same time as doing, you know, obstetric, you know, the the obstetric ultrasounds. Yeah. Um. Do you do you know anybody who's got experience with using ultrasound? To... Uh, I don't think that there is evidence uh, to do uh, a lung ultrasound in this kind of a scenario. I mean, lung ultrasound is is not a very good diagnostic tool at all. It's of course non-invasive, but uh, we don't use it uh, routinely. We use it if we suspect. Uh, pleural effusion, which is not very common. In fact, it's extremely rare in uh, in uh, COVID-19 pneumonia. So this is not uh, used. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rehan, there are a few questions for you. They, uh, some of them, uh, I'll give them to you in clusters. So the universal precautions in antenatal management in view of the asymptomatic um, presentation of COVID-19 in pregnancy and how can we reconcile home visits uh, in view of the asymptomatic pregnant women uh, with COVID? And have your outpatient induction rates gone up? It's, it's a, these are a fantastic series of questions. One of the reasons they're very difficult to answer is from a public health perspective, it depends where a locality or a nation is with regards to its pandem pandemic curve. Um, uh, and we witnessed this certainly within the United Kingdom over the last three months because the general behaviours that the public were asked to adopt varied with time. Uh, sometimes we were asked to adopt social distancing. Uh, other times we were asked to stop all inessential travel. Um, currently, we're allowed to travel again, but we're expected, I think, to wear face masks outside. Um, I, what I think this betrays is that there isn't always a very straight answer to this, because it's very predicated on the idea that you, in place, also have adequate provision for quarantine and for testing. And this varies from country to country. 
But with regards to specifically what we do, if one thinks about the antenatal care setting, that could take place at home or it could take place in a hospital. Either way, there has to be some consideration towards infection prevention uh, control strategies. But to, to a large extent, they, they have to be locally driven. If you can mute, thank you. They have to be locally driven because it depends where you are in the pandemic and it depends what your local and regional policy is. But certain pragmatic things are likely to be successful. So, for example, in a low income setting where testing is not uh, feasible, it seems that you, uh, depending on where you are, you could adopt the view that everybody walking in has COVID. And there have been times in the, in the United Kingdom in, in hospitals or in homes where we have adopted that view. And therefore, some degree of PPE is decreed necessary. And then depending on the country you're in, that PPE might be according to the World Health Organization criteria or there might be a different national criteria. You could also consider measures such as checking temperature at the door, and you could also consider measures such as doing symptom inquiry at the door before somebody can come in. You certainly have to consider that if somebody walks into a clinical area, they may or may not be walking straight into a clinical room, and they might, be, have, to be, uh, might have to sit in a waiting area. And how, how you socially distance within that area, again, depends on whether you're running a one-meter rule or a two-meter rule or a different rule about how far apart people need to be. So in summary, it's very complex, but it repays local discussion and local organisation. It really, really does. And I think the trick this kind of thing is to keep talking about it and not assume that the solution is reached locally. Uh, Rehan, can you be a bit louder, please? We can't hear. And can maybe request participants to mute, please? Uh, there's a lot of noise in the background. Right, I have now unmuted myself. Yes. Is it me? Can you hear me now? Yeah. So I think just to summarize what I was saying, I think there is not going to be a one size fits all definitive strategy because it's too dependent on where a locality is on the pandemic curve and what nationally or regionally has been debate has been debated and decided to be. Uh, uh, appropriate social distancing behaviour or quarantine behaviour or, uh, or local testing strategy. But in all settings, I think social distancing is likely to be appropriate. I think if possible, the use of masks is likely to be appropriate. And uh, I, I, think, I think thinking very carefully about symptom inquiry and about temperature checking is likely to be important. Now, with regards to home visits, which is the other part of the question. Actually, all of the same questions and answers still apply. In the, in the home visiting set, uh, setting, there still has to be consideration towards infection prevention control, and it has to rely on what the interpretation is about appropriate PPE in that particular locality. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rehan. Uh, thrombo prophylaxis for asymptomatic COVID, is that recommended? Hanka or uh, Rehan, either of you, or asymptomatic pregnancies, do you recommend? Uh, yes, I would uh, definitely recommend thrombo prophylaxis uh, in, uh, in, in patients uh, yeah, uh, who, who are um, in, at least in hospital, in the hospital setting, should have the uh, thrombo prophylaxis. I think I think I would agree with that, and that probably answers the question because the people in the hospital setting are not asymptomatic. So I think where the cutoff is probably lies, and I would confess this is pragmatic, Shakila, is I, I think if you are hospitalised with COVID, you need a thromboprophylaxis protocol. The typical UK protocol would involve medical thromboprophylaxis with molecular heparin during the admission and for 10 days afterwards. But if your COVID is not so severe during pregnancy to require hospitalization, the recommendation is likely to be more along the lines of maintaining good hydration and staying mobile. Okay. 
Um, uh, Joe, uh, twin pregnancy, uh, what's the scanning protocol during the pandemic? Sorry, say, sorry, say again? Twin pregnancy scanning. Okay, twin, twin pregnancy, you would follow the normal pre-pregnancy views in the sense that um, I would probably say we, we've, sorry, I'll rephrase that. For monochorionics, um, provided that they have got no signs of growth discrepancy, twin to twin transfusion, instead of two weekly, we're trying to space them to four weekly. Sorry, instead of two weekly, we're trying to space them to three weekly, um, you know, if there's absolutely no, no indications. In terms of the dichorionics, um, yeah, we wouldn't, you know, change them because they're already down to four weekly scans anyway. Um, and therefore, we wouldn't change that, um, redu reduce it further. So for twins, you know, four weekly, and for monochorionics, uncomplicated, uh, three weekly. Okay. Thank you. And Heinka, just a clarification, the thromboprophylaxis for asymptomatic COVID includes those who are picked up as part of the universal screening. Is that what you mean? That's just a clarification asked. Uh, completely normal, just because you're doing a universal screening, you happen to pick these women up. Would you still recommend thromboprophylaxis? Thromboprophylaxis is a very difficult field. And uh, so I, if, if, they, if any woman has got additional risk factors, I would always give uh, thromboprophylaxis. And uh, people have done, uh, many clinicians have actually set up local guidelines uh, uh, you know, for thromboprophylaxis, uh, for example, at hospital discharge to, uh, I mean, we have been giving patients uh, kind of low molecular weight heparin uh, once they were at home to continue uh, if there was kind of additional risk factors. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, the, there are ongoing trials and we don't know currently kind of uh, who is at a particular risk. Uh, Heike, can I just ask again about thromboprophylaxis? Is there is it related to weight based at all? You know, um, I've seen somewhere that you know for women over a certain weight, you would increase the dosage. Yes, uh, that is also something which has been recommended uh, to uh, increase. Uh, uh, the, the dose of, of, of low, low molecular weight uh, heparin. And I think uh, having seen all these complications uh, and even, uh, you know, you cannot actually uh, definitely do demonstrate in some patients that they are having thromboembolic uh, events, uh, but there have been some studies, you know, a post-mortem uh, which have uh, shown that there are kind of microembolic events. And I think this is, uh, I think this is really important, yeah. Um, sorry, last question about that. In terms of D-dimers, do you titrate your response with D-dimers? Yeah, I mean, there, there was a question by the public, uh, kind of how often you would uh, do D-dimers and other prognostic markers. I think this is, uh, there, there are, uh, again, uh, ongoing trials will tell us, but at the moment, it is very difficult to know uh, kind of how often this should be done. And I think it's a clinical judgment. Uh, and certainly in my own practice, we have been doing COVID screens, which include D-dimer kind of intermittently. And if D-dimers were significantly high, we have uh, given patients uh, 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 thromboprophylaxis uh, as an outpatient, so two weeks uh, kind of post-discharge, but the evidence is not uh, quite there as yet. Sure, thank you, that's interesting. Um there has been a question on uh, preeclampsia, COVID mimicking preeclampsia. Okay. And there has been a recent paper that was published in BJOG. There was a series of 42 women with COVID um, in Spain, where they said 14% of those who were diagnosed with COVID had uh, features that are similar to preeclampsia. And when they looked at those who had severe COVID, on 75% had features very similar to preeclampsia, you know, the thrombocytopenia, raised liver function, uh, shortness of breath, uh, the, the renal uh, function is affected. And what, um, again, please be aware is just 42 patients, so I wouldn't do a lot. This is just, but it's, it's interesting to see that they noticed that when they used LDH as a marker, um, it was only raised in women with preeclampsia and not in COVID, and also s flitch as well as another marker. So just be aware, this just to be aware as clinicians that uh, there could be similar presentations for COVID and preeclampsia. That's very interesting. I think, 
I think um, I think I think what I'm reflecting on with regard to that is in 2020 we still don't have a clear answer about what preeclampsia is or what causes it. I spent most of my professional career thinking about the central disease. And I'm um, now reconsidering whether it's the cardiovascular disease. And I, I think in that light, when you have two different multi-organ syndromic conditions, um, uh, there is likely to be crossover. So it's probably a little bit too early to say. Thanks, Rehan. And, and I know we are reaching towards the end of the webinar. We're just going to extend it by another five, ten minutes. Uh, so we can answer the questions that have come through YouTube. Uma, do you have questions for the panelists? Yes, thanks, uh, Shakila. I do. Am I audible? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. So uh, the first question, I don't know, maybe you may want to take it or, or any one of the others. In a low-income setting, do you have any guidance or is there any publication regarding triage of patients who are COVID-positive uh, if we don't have access to lab tests. I don't know if Hanka wants to take it or you want to answer that. So again, uh, I think, I mean, the access to lab tests is not vital. And uh, I mean, having worked on a COVID ward, you don't really need PCR because also often the PCR was actually negative. And uh, as I said before, if you are a clinician, you will know who is uh, who has COVID uh, after a while. And I think from a tri triage point of view, you obviously need to do a symptom check uh, and you need to, uh, you know, you need to do your, uh, you know, like your temperature check, etc. Uh, and I think uh, uh, in that way, uh, you can uh, kind of, I mean, it's, I think it is difficult, of course, if you don't have side rooms, etc. We have got the uh, you know, we have the facilities uh, in London where we can uh, obviously place patients in a, into a side room. And if we uh, were very suspicious of COVID pneumonia, they were remaining in the side room until we had a, a kind of uh, confirmed uh, that they didn't, they, we had an alternative diagnosis and we were sure that they didn't have COVID. It, it is difficult, but I think you don't always need to have a PCR. Okay. Um, and one of the things I would say is um, that is a website This is run by the Burnett University in Australia, and they have got living guidelines. Um, so they uh, provide the update of all guidelines, including FOGSI, uh, the Philippine, uh, Philipp uh, from the Philippines. So I'm just going to sort of quickly share, and it's a really good uh, resource. Can you see? Uh, yeah, we can. Yeah, yeah good. Uh, so what it says is, um, as you can see in the Excel uh, sheet underneath, uh, this is just freely available, downloadable. So these are the guidelines for whom you should uh, hospitalize. So this is uh, FOGC in India, uh, Philippines, and also all the other RCOGs uh, and bodies. And you can try the recommendations for fluid balance, oxygen saturation. And this is all for pregnant women. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, we, we shall um, have a look at it. And it's a really good okay. resource, and they update it all the time. Um, so Josh Vogel, um, who's leading this, and we link with him from a living systematic review. So we provide the latest evidence, and he also looks at the evidence throughout what's being recommended. And it's a good one portal to go to um, to look at the different interventions. Um, you want it's Burnett B U R N E T Burnett University. Okay. Um. The, uh, the next question is how sensitive is a low oxygen saturation uh, if uh, you have a symptomatic woman or low oxygen saturation alone in the absence of other symptoms? Okay, so that's probably a question for me. Uh, so what is recommended is to uh, actually exercise uh, uh, and a person who is uh, uh, where you suspect COVID-19 pneumonia uh, and if you have a low oxygen saturation without uh, a, an obvious explanation, uh, then that is something where that is suspicious of COVID-19 uh, pneumonia. Uh, so I think uh, it is if you really just only have uh, a sat meter and you, you are convinced that your reading is accurate, uh, then I think, yes, uh, that is, uh, you know, that is quite a good uh, kind of that's quite an accurate test. Uh, and as I said, if you are 
if you are worried that somebody has got COVID-19 pneumonia, what we used to do is we used to exercise them in the ED department. So we used to ask them to walk around and then measure their saturations again. And if they did, uh, did have a significant desaturation, uh, we, uh, we sometimes admitted these patients uh, due to that reason. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, this quest next question uh, is to Joe. Can you repeat at what gestation you want to scan? Does it make a difference if the woman has well-controlled gestational diabetes, uh, if she's just on diet or if she's on medication, uh, would it still be 28 and 34? Um, well, I mean, I, I think, you know, if she's well, very well-controlled um, on diet or, you know, possibly metformin, I think you can probably be safe to space them out, you know, in discussion with your diabetic physicians as well. I think if, if you are sort of stretched in terms of your resources and you want to reduce, you know, footfall, I personally think 28 and 36 are probably okay. But it's it very much depends on, you know, you probably have to then individualize the, you know, the need uh, according to each patient. But, you know, from our point of view, if your GDM is well controlled on diet, you know, or on metformin, then, you know, I think, you know, 28 and 36 are probably enough. Yeah, because in India, we have a fairly large number of gestational diabetics. So, well, exactly. Uh, if they're then, well then, controlled, if we have to call them in every four weeks, it's basically okay. no, no, the resources. They're, so, if they're well yeah. controlled, I would just do one scan at 36. Yeah. And, and, and also, okay. I would say, uh, Uma, at the Bar Self Trust, um, yeah. we have a huge population from um, Bangladesh, a huge Asian sure. population. GDMs on diet who are well controlled, in fact, we were not doing any growth scans and been doing audit for 10 years. And our yeah. outcomes okay. are very similar to those um, other units in the rest of the country who've been doing yeah. serial growth scans. So I would say this is be the easiest population for you to be reassured. If your resources don't allow you to do frequent scan, as any scan, that's fine. 20 yeah. week scan, as right. long as the sugars are well controlled, um, it should be fine. Yeah, but Actually, I the bigger scan, so then a 36 week scan, as Joe mentioned, would sort of give reassurance to plan delivery. But if you are not sure. able to, then it should be okay. Actually, the bigger challenge for us is getting these women's sugars to be tested and then us informed because many of them don't have access to glucometers and uh, so and if and that's a population especially if they're obese you're worried about preeclampsia so it's but the woman is more worried about her scan not being done while we are more worried about other things sure. um, so the last question uh, maybe uh, Shakila you or Rehan can take it um, if, the, if a healthcare provider is in her first trimester and unable to abstain from her work, um, how should, what precautions should she take? I guess part of the question is, should she abstain from work or can she continue to, to work? That's, it's a very good and very difficult question. <clears throat> Guidance naturally does vary. Certainly at the beginning of the pandemic was the perception that pregnant women are a particularly vulnerable group. I think the data that we now have does not necessarily suggest that pregnant women are a vulnerable group. But that is likely to still be the guidance. But a different way of looking at things is that you are probably may be definitely more likely to catch the virus if you see patients full stop. Because the nature of what we do is we come into contact with people who aren't well. So that explains why in localities where they've started universal testing, when you stratify that and look at the universal testing results of um, healthcare professionals, they have far higher levels of uh, far high, far higher numbers and far higher proportions of IgG. I think Tanker within Bart's health, we are starting to get that data, aren't we? And it, it's much more than in the general population. So therefore, I think the risk 
give exposure by being a healthcare professional is higher. That therefore emphasizes the need for appropriate PPE and perhaps that is now being discussed in the United Kingdom for um, a risk review about what PPE is needed for individuals with their line management. This is a very live topic. The United Kingdom uh, guidance uh, is very carefully written uh, from the RCOG with regards to working if you are pregnant. It does not especially stratify between being a healthcare professional or not. But I think it's very difficult because you, you want to feel safe at work. And the idea that actually there might be some groups of people who should be offered enhanced PPE is a, a building argument. Mm. Okay. Um, okay. Am I still frozen? Yeah. Am I no, still frozen? No, thanks, Rehan. And um, last couple of minutes, Joe, you wanted to answer a few questions. And yes, then you know, there, the, there was a... All the panel couple, reports, yeah. Yeah, there was a question about... Hang on, sorry. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, Abnormal dog about, about an IPT. When when can you do free fetal DNA? Free fetal DNA testing um, is is obviously going to take more traction now because you know of the the need not to attend you know hospital and undergo a scan. I mean, technically you can do it from ten weeks till term. However, it, you know we have to stress that an IPT without a good scan can be quite dangerous because it does it will not pick up a lot of problems it may pick up down syndrome it might not pick up trisomy 13 18 so if you miss your first trimester screening you can probably do free fetal dna you know beyond that but it has to be backed up with a good scan you know which will exclude major structural abnormalities so that that is that is quite important um, and sorry, there was another question um, regarding um, regarding what was it? What was it? Um, yes, uh, somebody said if we reinstated thirty six routing scan, should we stop it again? I think again, it's a question of resources. If you can guarantee that your waiting room is not going to be crowded, and you can keep social distancing, then you can have it. But if you had to pull one scan out. From the whole setup, it would be your 36 week scan. So, again, it depends on your availability. Okay, so that brings us to a close um, for this first webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that we haven't managed to answer all of the questions, we've tried to answer most of them. So what we will do is we shall try to answer them at the next webinar. Maybe we'll put our answers in the chat function. So people can go to the chat and look at the answers from the previous one if it's not covered. Uh, and uh, just a reminder, the next one is on intrapartum care on the 11th of July. So same time. Look forward to um, seeing you all there. And thanks so much for the panel and the organizers, both in UK and India, uh, for uh, making this and uh, we managed to go through Zoom without an issue. So that's great. So see you uh, next time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.